Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. I'm sitting down in the shafts with my sister Soraka. And I'm sitting down in the shafts with my brother Aaron. And we have been toiling with a lot of noises that the shafts is very much open and susceptible to. So uh, Yeah, we, we found out this last week how very, very not soundproof this shafts is. Yeah, so uh, bells and planes and children screaming. The reason we've been doing so many works. podcasting is Noises, backgrounds, shouts, people getting killed, shots. Aaron at, continuing to talk uh, over yeah, me, me for hours lot, and so. hours and hours. The reason we've been here so often lately and the reason we've been like noticing this more is because It's our birthday! And for our birthday, we are kind of just doing a, a, a month of Patreon patron supporter Appreciation Pre- month. Oh yeah, there you go. Got there eventually. I got there eventually. She's doing a lot of hand gestures. It was great. I was I was looking for the words with your hands. <laughs> with my hands in front of the microphone. So anyway, thank you very much for all of the patrons that we have so far. We're gonna read out all of the people who actually have helped us buy the microphone, buy these headphones, and make it possible for us to get into the room to record. So that's unbelievably helpful. And now we're basically going to go, here's a tote bag for anyone who wants to support us in the month of November 2019. So that's what we're doing. Want to join and support pa- Patreon? Uh, go to candletales.com forward slash Patreon. No, no patreon.com forward slash candletales. I did it wrong on purpose. You did it wrong on purpose? Okay, cool. Patreon.com forward slash candletales. <laughs> Is the correct place that you go to. What was it again? Patreon.com forward slash Candlelit Tales. All oh, right, that's three times. Yeah, you that's probably three times heard it. You remember now. So, so this basically, in honour of that, we are doing two things. One is that we're giving away the tote bags. Tote bags. Which are fun. They have our logo on them. They're really cool. They're black. They're reusable. You know, they're like save the planet t-shirt. Friendly. And the other thing we're doing is that we are re-recording the tone. There's fucking loads of it. There's so much of it and there's so much of it and there's so many versions of it that what we ended up doing is picking a book. One. Which is Cucullin of Martevna by Lady Gregory and kind of tweaking our version of the tone and marrying it with some of her details and descriptions and point of view on it. Yeah. Basically. So that's basically what we're going to do and we have that boiled down and condensed to five parts because it's our fifth birthday also because it's really long so <laughs> that's the condensed version and our, for our fifth birthday we're going to be putting this out every week you. so not every other week that we aim for usually <laughs> we usually get there sometimes we don't um, sometimes it's we hard. skip we, sometimes we miss one it's hard because it's, it's hard uh, but we're going to be aiming to put this out every single week yep. uh, until the end of it and we also have two bonus episodes. Yeah. Which we will hope to release during the month of November, but that is going to have to be dependent on... Basically, if we get enough support on Patreon, I was going to aim for 20, maybe like 10 new supporters in the month of yeah, November. Yeah, I think that'd be nice. That'd be I nice, I think that'd right? be awesome. So that's it, basically. We, we want to send a huge shout out and a huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. A huge thank you to all of you who are listening. Because also. Because, to be honest... You know, we know what it's like being broke. Yep. If you can't afford to support us on Patreon. That's grand. That's grand. We're not like mad at you. We yeah. still are really grateful that you're listening and enjoying. Yeah. And also. And, sharing and listening and giving us feedback and telling us that you are smiling on the train going into work because you're listening to us shite talk. And no, no, it's great. It makes it us feel like that, that. that's wonderful. So like, you know, if, if you can't for- support us financially, you can support us. Lots of other ways Emotionally Emotionally I do like a bit of emotional support Aaron myself. needs lots of emotional just, support Just you know I just like to know That someone's listening to me He's that's just all, Really He just you know. needs a lot Just a little li- just, just a, a little lot. Just a little A lot of the time That's all <laughs> You know It's a little, little attention A lot of the time It's fine That's um, it That's it It so adds up to a lot Just just to clarify again It's our fifth birthday We started this five years ago In Stag's Head in Dublin Just telling stories Playing music And seeing if, if it was something was that people wanted to hear more often it is we've been asked to do podcasts we're asking people to support us if they can because we'd love to get the Shafa soundproofed that'd be our next aim on Man, Patreon that'd be the best that'd be great like that'd be great anyway we're not there yet but this, these five episodes are basically our condensed version of the Lady Gregory book and it's our, done our own way with amazing musicians we'll give them a shout out as well at the end to hear who actually played on each episode 
they put a load of work into this as well. It's, you know, it's always, it's kind of three parts always. The story is one part, the tellers is another part and the music is a whole other part. So that's mm-hmm. kind of how I always see it in that Triscoll side of things. Uh, so Yes, Aaron likes things being in threes. I do. Um, I also just wanted to say very quickly a thing that I forgot. What did you forget a thing? What, did you, what thing did you forget? She had a thought, I can see it. She's scratching her, her bottom lip with her tongue. What did you forget? Oh, she's Jesus, I had a bit of Oh, no, it's gone. gone. She forgot the thing You just she kept forgot. talking for a very long time and then yeah, I forgot I'll it. do that. Um, oh, well. She look, we'll tell you this story and then next oh, week... Oh, yeah, no, I, I remember it. I have, I have it again now. Go what I wanted me. to say to people was, you might miss us kind of shy talking after the podcast. I know some people like that. And uh, what we've decided to do for these is that because we're recording these together in the shop office and we're swapping back and forth in these tellings, what we ended up doing was just kind of pausing and having a lot of that conversation as we were recording. Yeah. So those outtakes and other outtakes are going to be going up on Patreon.com for Patreon patrons. So if you miss the shy talk. <laughs> Patreon patrons. It's really hard to say. <laughs> patrons and Patreon. Patrons and Patreon. Patrons and Patreon. Can't do it. Uh, so if you if you miss the shy talk, you know any any basically all of our all of our rewards are flat because I thoroughly we, we don't want to discriminate because it makes me sound very silly a lot of the times. But anyway, I'm Aaron putting him out there. Doesn't like putting his mistakes up. She's also finally getting around to putting up a little bit of writing on the sources that have yes. filled her head since she's started Candle of Tales. It's too much noise in my brain, Aaron. You know this. It's hard for me to separate it out and write it down. I yeah, I understand. It's difficult for all the lot of us. Anyway, look, lads. <laughs> It's storytelling time now. We're going to crack into the very first part of the thorn. We're going to crack into, well, it's it's set in Connacht and that's where the whole story begins. Take her away. In Connacht, long ago, stood the fortress Cruachan I. Nearby the hill of Cruachan itself, where some say the Morrigan did dwell. A passageway to the other world itself, where all forms of creatures could crawl out, often led by the triple goddess of the battle fury, the Marignu. The goddess with so many names. Maka, Bav, Anand. The goddess who it was said was at the edge of every battle, in the corner of near every fight, and in the midst of any argument her presence could be felt as she laid the seeds for strife. And ruin. The hall of Cruachan I was the dwelling place of Queen Maeve. It was split into seven great chambers, each more richly decorated than the last, and at the center were two seats, one for Maeve herself, and one for all Eil MacMothoc, her consort, the son of the King of Leinster. In the center of this great hall was a great pillar that could be struck to call out for all the allies and armies of Connacht and all the people that were loyal to Maeve would gather when they heard it. This is where they stayed in state. Although it was a strange place to be, with creatures and visions seeping out of the hill of Krukon I from time to time. Nightmarish visions of the hall on fire or plagues of swine that devastated the province, no matter where they trampled. No matter what came from the hill, Maeve was always an equal to it, because Queen Maeve was the queen of all Connacht. (laughs) 
One day, as she sat there with her consort, Oliel, a messenger came running to them. He said a great host was marching towards them. And Maeve asked him what appearance they had on them. And he told her. Warriors in chariots they were, with gleaming spears held above them, and banners snapping in the wind. But they did not look like they were going to war. They looked like they were coming from a fight, and a hard fight at that. Chief among them, he said, was a man who stood so tall he looked like an oak tree in the middle of a field. A great big bushy beard, and a huge head of hair, and a green cloak about his shoulders, clasped with gold. When she heard that, Maeve said, that is the appearance of Fergus McRoy, who once was the King of Ulster. But what can he want with me, and what can he be doing coming here? She had her servants open the gates. She brought in the exiles of Ulster, and gave them a feast for three days and three nights. And after three days and three nights, she asked them what they were doing here. Why had they come? Fergus, as the former King of Ulster, as the champion of Ulster and as the leader of this band, spoke for them all. Although there were many great warriors and high people among them, the son of King Crohor, Cormac Cunlingus, was there. The famous warrior Brickrew of the Bitter Tongue was there, and many more champions beside. But as their leader, it was Fergus who answered Maeve. He told her that they had come to Connacht for one reason and one reason only. And that was that she, Queen Maeve, was in Connacht. And it was well that they knew that there was no one in Ireland who hated Crohor Macnessa, the King of Ulster, more than did Queen Maeve. Queen Maeve had renamed her seven sons, Manya, after hearing a prophecy that King Crohor would be killed by a man named Manya, just to stack the deck a little bit. And so they thought this was the place for them. Because they had all of them taken an oath to get a vengeance on Grohor Magnessa. They were seeking vengeance because of a terrible wrong he had done. Now Fergus remembered many years before when Grohor was newly in his position as king. A position, by the way, that he had tricked Fergus himself out of, but Fergus hadn't held that against him, or at least he hadn't then. At this feast, an unearthly cry was heard, and they realised that the cry was coming from inside the womb of a pregnant woman. The druid Kaffa made a prophecy, said that the child that was being carried in that womb would be born as a woman more beautiful than anyone had ever seen. And because of her beauty, she would cause so much strife that the red branch would split in two. Now, Fergus, being a direct thinker, suggested that the best thing to do would be to kill the child while she was still unborn. But Crohor, who wanted to be seen to be a merciful king, said, no, we're not going to kill her. She's going to be raised in secret. And when she's of age, I will marry her myself. And I will put her in such a high place that no man will dare go after her. That was settled. And Fergus thought no more about the girl. Until one day, Many years later, when the sons of Ishnuk disappeared. They were three of Fergus's favourite pupils, three of the greatest warriors, the young warriors, the next generation coming, 
lions in battle. If every warrior in Ulster was dead and only the three of them left, they would be able to stand shoulder to shoulder to shoulder and defend Ulster against all of Ireland. They were brave, they were brilliant, they were loyal, and they were gone. And soon word spread around Awanmaka that they had gone with this beautiful, prophesized girl. This girl who would bring doom on the Red Branch. A girl named Deirdre. Crohor MacNessa, the king, had been furious, beside himself with rage. He'd sent out parties hunting high and low for the sons of Ishnuk to bring Deirdre back, willing or unwilling. But none of his search parties came back with anything. And soon they understood the sons of Ishnuk had left Ireland altogether. But Crohor never let go of his rage, never let go of his bitterness and his anger. And Fergus wondered at that. It made him look bad, made him look weak made him look petty. And so from time to time down through the years, Fergus would ask him if maybe it was time to forgive the sons of Ishnuk. They were so much stronger with them in the fold. But time after time down through the years, Crohor refused, still holding on to that bitterness, still holding on to that rage. And every time he refused, Fergus thought a little bit less of him. And so he was delighted one day when Grahor came to him and told him that he was ready to forgive the sons of Ishnuk. He asked Fergus what would he do if Grahor sent him to High Hilled Alban to bring them a message, to bring them back to Ireland under his protection, what would Fergus do? to anyone who tried to harm them. Fergus replied honestly. He would kill anyone who went against the sons of Ishnuk, except for his own king, who he was sworn to, because nothing would induce him to break his word and kill his king. And Fergus thought nothing of the fact that it was with this statement that Grohor sent him to retrieve the sons of Ishnuk. Now Nisha, Onla and Ardon were delighted to see their old mentor Fergus coming for them. But the woman Deirdre, well she was beautiful but Fergus couldn't see what the fuss was about because she was a big bag of tears. All she did was weep and wail and complain and tell him he was full of lies and treachery when Fergus spoke no word but truth. And frankly he was getting a bit tired of her by the time they arrived back in Ireland. And waiting for them there at the beach was a messenger to call Fergus away to a feast that was being held in his honour. Now there was a gesh on Fergus never to refuse a feast thrown in his honour, so of course he had to go, although the woman Deirdre berated him, called him all sorts of ill names. He asked the sons of Ishnuk to wait for him, but they were homesick and they were determined to go on. So Fergus sent them on, under the protection of his own two sons, fair-haired Illan, rough-red Buena, and his assurance that he would catch up to them as soon as he could. And in truth, he told Maeve, he bolted his food at that feast. He stayed not a moment longer than politeness dictated. But for all his haste, he arrived back too late. Awan Maka was burning and the smoke hung heavy in the sky above it, and the ground under his feet squelched with the blood that had been spilt there. The sons of Ishnuk were dead. His own son, Ilan, dead. Crohor MacNessa had betrayed every promise he had ever made to Fergus, and Fergus saw then that this was no man who was worthy of his loyalty. This was no man of honour. The king was as petty and small and jealous and weak as Fergus had ever feared. And Fergus drew his sword then, his great sword Leocon, 
that cast a rainbow across the sky when he pulled it from its sheath, that could cut down ten men in one blow. And he bellowed out a call to arms to every man of Ulster who valued honour above the loyalty that they had sworn to a treacherous king. Those men flocked to him, among them the king's own son Cormac, and Fergus led those men in a terrible battle. The red branch twisted and tore asunder. They fought their way through the mercenaries Crohor had gathered there that day, and they fought as well with men they had called brother the day before. More blood was spilled on that day than had been in the beating hearts of the men who'd heard the prophecy so many years before. And at the end of that terrible battle, Fergus took his followers, told them they were no longer Crave Rua, no longer Red Branch. They were now the exiles of Ulster, and they had one mission. And he led them to Cruachan Eye because it was in Cruachan Eye they would have the best chance of fulfilling that mission. And what is that mission? Maeve asked him. We will not rest easy, Fergus said, until we have the head of Crohor Magnessa as our trophy. Now Maeve was delighted to hear this coming from Fergus, the previous king of Ulster. Her name quite literally meant the one that will intoxicate men. And Fergus had known by coming to Maeve he was not only coming to an enemy of Crohor, but, well, Crohor's ex. They had, after all, once been married to Crohor and Maeve, but it didn't work out. You see, Maeve had a very specific bright price. No high quantity of wealth would be given to her, no. She demanded three simple things. To be as generous as her, which Crower was in spades. To be as brave as her, which again Crower was, riding into the battles with his sister Dectra on the chariot by his side, but the final bright price that Maeve demanded of her husband was to have no jealousy. And this was one thing Grohor was not. He was exceedingly jealous. But Maeve never had one man without another man waiting in the shadows. Maeve, after all, needed seven or potentially thirty-two men to satisfy her huge appetite in one day. Crohor could not quite take this. So the marriage ended, they did not end on good terms, and one day after they ended things, Maeve was washing herself, bathing in the River Boyne, Crohor still lusting after her, snuck up upon her and forced himself upon the bathing Maeve. She hated him more than anyone else in Ireland after that, so much so that when her sister Clothra then married Crohor and became pregnant with their child, Maeve snuck upon her sister Clothra, stabbing her in the womb, killing infant and mother in one go. Maeve's rage was well known throughout Ireland. And this was why Fergus MacRoy had come to Queen Maeve of Crookon Eye, because he knew with her he might have a chance of avenging his honour against Crohor, the King of Ulster. Maeve lent her long, pale face, staring straight at Fergus with her flowing cloak behind her and her flowing hair that seemed in the red light of the setting sun to gleam a shining red. She stared at Fergus, who was known as Fergus of the Horses, and she wondered were the rumours true. 
Did it really take nine women to satisfy Fergus McRoy? Needless to say, the two became lovers. Even though Maeve's appetite was huge and Fergus's legendary, they managed to satisfy one another. I can only assume that not a lot of ruling was done while the two lay in bed. This would all have been fine, only for the fact that Maeve's consort and husband of sorts, Aulil, was lying in wait for Maeve to come visit him in his own bed. He had married Maeve, fulfilling the three conditions of her bright price. He was as generous as her, he was as brave, and he acted without any jealousy. He seemed not to be jealous of any of the men that lay waiting in the shadows to satisfy Maeve's desires, but when he saw Fergus of the horses lay with Maeve, well, he realized that maybe his nickname didn't come about from being very good with horses. Legend had it, he also had a very big sword, named Leocon, which he was a bit jealous about. Now, all he'll became obsessed with this relationship Maeve was now fostering with Fergus. Now, after many a night, after Fergus and the exiles of Ulster had arrived in Crocon Eye, Maeve eventually visited her consort, Aulil, in his own chamber. Aulil lay with Maeve, and he lay awake for the whole of the night as she slept in the side of his bed. Something wormed away inside of him. This jealousy he did not admit that he had. Instead, as the sun rose, he woke her with a statement, telling her how lucky she was to be married to him. He reminded her that she used to cower away in Kruokon Eye while men raided and took and stole what they wanted from her lands. And wasn't she so much better off now that she was married to Oliel MacMothog so he could protect her and how much richer she was for the marriage as well? Maeve was stunned. Her flowing hair down the side of the bed. Her pale face went paler still and her steely eyes set to Oliel MacMothog. She reminded him that she was the daughter of the High King, Oki Fedlock, and she had no need for the protection of any man, for she was first into any battle, and her bravery was well known throughout the lands of Connacht and beyond, and no one would dare face her in battle. In retort, Oliel mocked back that her father had been High King, but now who sat on the throne, only his eldest brother was the High King of all Ireland, and it was his other brother that was the High King of Leinster, the most prosperous province in all Ireland. And it was with his wealth that she was able to be so luxurious in her lifestyle. At this, Maeve's teeth gritted. She flipped her flowing hair and gathered her gown tightly around her waist as she stood towering above all ill. She called for her servants to come and count out all of her jewellery and rings, all of her wealth, all of her gold and silver to be stacked high and counted as she stared all ill MacMothock down told him to do exactly the same. Aulil and Maeve's wealth was gathered there in Crocon Eye. Every single ring, precious stone, piece of jewellery, ornament was counted, gathered, weighed and found to be equal. Then they turned to their cloaks and garments, fine precious silks, the wines, whatever they had in store, all found to be equal. 
they counted their servants and serving maids equal to the last number. Now Maeve was growing frantic as they went to the livestock then. They found that all of the land they owned was matched by the others' holdings. Even the chickens were equal to the number of chickens the other held. Pigs and sheep were counted and flocks massed and gathered, still found to be equal until they went to the cattle. And finally, there was a difference. Shortly after all Il McMothock had come to Cruachan I, Maeve had been happy that he had succeeded in fulfilling her bride price and so gave him so many gifts that day that now she realised she had outdone herself and found the balance being tipped away from her favour. She was not an equal in this anymore, for she had gifted him a red gold plate the size of his head, an arm ring that went right around the thickest part of his arm, and a bull that belonged to her herds. He was born out of her herds, and though it was a great brilliant bull, he had never seemed happy in her herds. He had bucked and kicked so she wanted rid of this young bull and given him to Oliel McMothock. But the beast grew past the size of maturity. It kept growing to such a size that thirty men could climb upon the back of the brute if they dared to even go into the same field as the white-horned bull of Crocon I. This ferocious beast was like no other in any one of the herds, and all ill scoffed and laughed, and told Maeve that it was he that was the better of the two. After all, he was the owner of the white horned bull. Maeve's jaw set firm. Her eyes scowled down, and her flowing cloak snapped in the wind as she hurried back to Crocon Eye, away from the fields of her cattle the white horned bull of Crocon. She snapped her fingers towards Makaroth, her best servant and messenger. She asked him to scour the country for a bull the like of which had never been seen, any bull that came close to matching the white horned bull of Crocon. I, she needed it, she demanded it, she wanted it. Makaroth smiled. He knew well where there was one. Sure it's over on Cooley, he said. It is the brown bull of Cooley. The hills of Cooley were where the brown bull, the Don Cuyla, roamed. And his owner was a man named Dara of Cooley. And it was to his household that McGrath brought a small band of servants carrying gifts from Queen Maeve. And he, McGrath, carrying the offer of Queen Maeve, the honeyed words that she'd poured out for him. Now Dara welcomed these travellers from Connacht, and he welcomed them still more when McGrath explained to him all that Maeve desired, and all that she would pay him for it. You see, Queen Maeve didn't want to buy the brown bull of Cooley, because she knew it was too great a prize. No amount of wealth would compensate for such a creature. All she asked was that the bull be lent to her for a year so that she could put it to stud in her herds, so that a bull the equal of Fionbanok, the white horned bull of Cruachon I, could be born to her herds. And for this small favour, she was prepared to offer Dara great lands in Connacht, the friendship of her thighs, riches beyond his wildest dreams. And so Dara of Cooley, who was a landowner and a cattle farmer, who had never expected to own a creature as prized and as wonderful as the brown bull, 
he was delighted to agree. Dara went to bed early, well satisfied with the bargain. Because giving away the brown bull was something he would never contemplate. But lending it out for a year? That was a good deal. It took a lot to keep a bull that size fed and watered for a year. A bull that 30 kids could play hurling across the back of, if they were brave enough to come close to it. McGrath as well took to his bed, happy with the bargain he had made, delighted at the good news he would be bringing back to his queen, looking forward to how pleased Maeve would be with him. But the men that McGrath had brought with him did not go to bed early. They stayed up, enjoying the hospitality of Dara of Cooley, and his servants kept bringing them delicious food, strong wine, strong ale, and strong mead. And at one point in the night, just as the servant was coming in to refill their cups yet again, one of the men of Connacht turned to his companion and said, with great relief, I am so glad that Dara of Gooley agreed to this. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for Maeve to try and take a bull like this by force, going against the Crave Rua, the red branch of Ulster? And his companion turned to him and said, I think you are vastly underestimating our queen. If Dara of Cooley had refused her offer, Maeve would come. She would make a meal of the Ulster men, and she would steal that bull all for herself. It's a wise man Dara is, for not going against our queen. The servant heard this. He left their food without a word left their wine and then withdrew, woke up Dara of Cooley and told him what he'd overheard. And so it was the next morning. McGrath came downstairs expecting a warm welcome from Dara when he'd parted with him on such friendly terms the night before. But he found Dara cold. told him that because of the insult that had been spoken under his own roof at his own table that the deal was off and if Maeve wanted the brown bull of Cooley and if Maeve thought it would be so easy to take the brown bull of Cooley she was welcome to try McGrath protested Oh, but Jesus, they were drunk, like, they're, they're, they're fools, they're all ages when they're drunk, they're ages when they're sober too, but they're especially stupid when they're drunk, don't, don't take anything they say like that to heart. But what was said now could not be unsaid, and McGrath went back to Kruakanai to deliver the message to Maeve that if she wanted the brown bull of Cooley, she would have to take it by force. Maeve was furious. This was an almost impossible task. As she looked across the field surrounding Crocanoi, she wondered how many men, how many women would have to fight to get the great brown bull of Cooley. She raged for a whole day and a night, till furious she turned to Fergus, exclaiming how hard it would be for her to obtain the brown bull of Cooley, even with half of the Crave Rua, the Red Branch exiles in Cruachan, to march against the Crave Rua in Ulster was a different matter altogether. But Fergus said, My queen, it might not be as hard as you think. Has anyone ever told you the story of the curse of Maka?
All right. So that was the first part of the five parts of what will be our November Patreon Appreciation Month. Thanking you all for supporting us. This podcast was brought to you by Amy, Anna, Anne. Anne, Aoife, April, David, Emma. Emmet, Kiva, Margarita, Pamela, Ronan and Russell. Selina, Simone and that was it. That's it. Thank you very much. You made this possible. You're all legends. We only read out your first name because, you know, um, the music has been done by Oshin Ryan. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you want to find out what happens next in the thorn, tune in next week. <laughs>